So at this point in the evening, I have the great pleasure of formally introducing Mr. George Galloway. George Galloway um, has been a longtime social justice act activist and is a very well-known author, broadcaster, and political figure. Um, I understand from my readings that Mr. Galloway got involved in the Labour Party as a teenager and was one of the youngest constituency party secretaries in Dundee in Scotland in the early 1970s. And he went on to serve as an MP in the British House of Commons uh, for over a quarter of a century from 1982 until uh, 2010. Now a very interesting thing um, to note is that he split from the Labour Party of Tony Blair in October of 2003 as a result of his opposition to the war in Iraq. So, Mr. Galloway has a record of being a person of principle and a politician of principle, and in fact, uh, went on from this episode to form the anti-war coalition party in all this respect. Now, on this side of the pond, as Canada is sometimes referred to, uh, the Canadian media really started to pay a lot of uh, attention to Mr. Galloway as a result of a 2009 decision by Jason Kenney, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, who oversees uh, the Canada Border Services Agency, which banned Mr. Galloway from entering Canada to speak in 2010, the Federal Court of Canada ruled that the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, Jason Kenney, had attempted to ban Mr. Galloway from Canada for purely political reasons.
back in the run up to the Iraq war, is this sound good? No, 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 Canada's national security. 
it would have come to uh, as a great surprise to the many speakers of the House of Commons under whom I sat five consecutive parliamentary terms chosen regularly as the parliamentarian of the year, the parliamentary debater of the year, little did the speaker know that all the while I was addressing the problems of the country and the world, I was in fact secretly plotting some terrorist outrage far away in Canada. <laughs> it would have come as a surprise to the security services of the United States of America because of course during the time I was banned from Canada, I was touring the United States, 50 cities in two years. I was visiting and speaking in the United Nations building in New York City. In fact, I was broadcasting from New York City where the terrorist atrocity took place to Canada by video link because Canada knew something the CIA didn't know, <laughs> namely my secret membership of a terrorist organization. But of course it didn't come as anything like the surprise that it came to the Canadian security services because not only had I regularly traveled to Canada and spoken in universities and public buildings in most of the major cities in Canada for the previous decade without the Canadian security services ever cottoning on to what Jason Kenney and Stephen Harper knew. I was a welcome visitor in Canada and in fact, and here we must thank the judicial process in Canada. Here we must thank them. When Jason Kenney said he's not getting in and that is that, that night I said on CBC, that is not that. It's not over as they say till the fat lady sings and the fat lady in this question is the grand old lady of Canadian justice. And I believe, I believe and I was right that Canada remains a country governed by laws and not by the whims of here today, gone tomorrow, I hope gone tomorrow, politicians. In the course of the Honourable Judge's hearing of the case, we miraculously managed to get a hold of all the secret documents that went on behind the scenes before, during, and after Jason Kenney's decision. They tried extremely hard. They moved motion after motion in front of the judge to try and stop our counsel and thereby the Canadian public having access to their email traffic. Wallahi, emails are a wonderful thing. You know, in the past, <laughs> paper could be easily disposed of but emails stay forever. <laughs> emails are forever. <laughs> and one of the emails from the Canadian security services themselves, who will be present in the hall somewhere. <laughs> I greet you, officers, I greet you. <laughs> the email from the Canadian security services told Jason Kenney that his statements were false that I was not a member of a terrorist organization and I was not a threat to the national security of Canada, yet the minister continued to insist and has repeated today that I was. So Jason Kenney knew more than the Canadian Security Services, the CIA, the Speaker of the House of Commons, Her Majesty the Queen. They knew more. Well, they'll have to prove it in open court because I have now begun legal action against the government of Canada
Now I know that's a mixed blessing for you as Canadian taxpayers. <laughs> because this case is already cost you a pretty penny and it's going to cost a pretty penny more. The good news is this. Every penny, every cent that we win in compensation here in the Canadian courts against the Canadian government will remain in Canada and be used to build the anti-war movement here in this country. situation. But I cannot, you wouldn't expect me to, I cannot be defamed in front of the entire world in such a way by a man who doesn't even have the courage to come out and face me and justify what he has done. So you can run, you can run Jason Kenny, but you can't hide. I'm looking for you and I'm going to find you. to freedom of speech. I'm not one of these libertarians who believes that a people are allowed to say and do anything that they want. There are limits. The one limit is libel and defamation. If I were to libel someone here this evening, it could prove an expensive business as Jason Kenny is going to find out. <laughs> but there are other limits. One such limit is the prohibition, just prohibition, against the whipping children, against people for what they are, not for anything they have done, but for what they are, what God made them as. And I have never in my entire life thought a racist thought, spoken a racist word, written a racist sentence or done a racist thing. I have all of my life been a man of the left. I joined the labor movement at the age of 13, having spent my childhood as a child actor in the political process in the labor movement, handing out leaflets at school gates. I have spent my whole life fighting racism. Anti-Semitism is a form of racism, one of the most virulent forms of racism, one which, as a Christian, European and North American phenomenon, is responsible for one of the greatest crimes in human history, the Holocaust and the refusal of powers here and in Europe to intervene, to stop that Holocaust before it was too late, to open the doors to the victims of that Holocaust. Anti-Semitism is pure poison. And I cannot be accused of it. I will not be accused of it. And anyone who accuses me of it will have to answer for it in a court of law because this foul lie is used to intimidate us. It's used to throw sand in the eyes of the public. How could someone like me be against Jews? Marx was a Jew. Trotsky was a Jew. Einstein was a Jew. Epstein was a Jew. Joe Slovo, the leader of the African National Congress fighting wing on Conte and Sesway, was a Jew. Noam Chomsky is a Jew. Paula, who sang for us tonight, is a Jew. There are thousands of Jews with us here in Canada, in this country. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews with us in this campaign around the world. There are thousands of Jews in Israel itself with us in this campaign. We are not against Jews. We are against the racist apartheid state of Israel and its silence as well. That's what we are against. And we will not be intimidated 
out of that. Personally, I'm not afraid of anyone except God. I'm afraid of the judgment day. That's what I'm afraid of. So, none of these bullies frighten me. They have nothing that I want. I have nothing that is important to me that they can take away. And we will not be bullied or intimidated in this regard. We believe that Zionism is an intrinsically racist ideology, that its practice in the apartheid state of Israel is disastrous for the Palestinian victims of this apartheid, it's disastrous for the people of the broader Middle East, it's disastrous in many ways, which I shall come to later, in the broader, wider Muslim world, and it's disastrous also for the Jews. That's the case that I will seek to make. When people were against communism in Russia, when they wanted to eliminate communism from Russia, it didn't mean that they wanted to eliminate the Russians. It didn't mean that they wanted to eliminate the country called Russia. When you're against a political system, when you're against an ideology, it doesn't mean that you hate the people who live under it, or that you wish to eradicate them or drive them somewhere. It just means that you oppose that political system and you are fighting for its defeat. And I have now given more than 35 years of my life to this Palestinian cause. And I shall never stop it. The case of the Palestinians is the greatest crime since the Second World War in the, in the world. This is something that many people in the West have been slow to grasp. But it hasn't been slow to be grasped by the two billions in the Muslim world. It's one of the great divides. The people in the West, most of them, certainly most of the powerful, most of the commentariat, the chattering classes, the political classes, the governors, the parliamentarians actually don't care very much about the suffering of the Palestinian people, but the Muslims of the world care about it a very great deal. Palestine was wiped off the map. There's a lot of talk about wiping countries off the map. We often hear the Iranian president accused of wanting to wipe Israel off the map. As a matter of fact, now every professor of Farsi from Tokyo to Timbuktu has testified that he actually never said any such thing, but be that as it may, Iran doesn't have the means of wiping Israel off the map. Although Israel has the means of wiping Iran off the map. Because Israel illegally is in possession of, secretly developed, ungoverned by any treaty, more than 300 nuclear weapons. Which we only know, by the way, thanks to the brave Jew Mordechai Vanunu, who went to prison for 22 years for telling us. country that actually has been wiped off the map. Palestine is the only country that's been wiped off the map. It's people scattered to the four corners of the earth. I always used that as a piece of rhetoric before, but last night, practically on the Arctic Circle in Yellowknife, I met six Palestinian refugee families living amidst the snow and the polar bears <laughs> of the Northwest Territories. And they're the lucky ones. <laughs> the unlucky 
ones have lived for the last 62 years in rancid, rat-infested refugee camps in the Arab countries nearby Palestine. Now in their millions, now generation after generation. The Palestinians have been hunted from pillar to post. They have been driven from country to country. They have been massacred. They are occupied. They are in their many thousands in prison. They are in the graveyards filled with the martyrs who stood up to this great crime. The Palestinians in country after country have been denied passports, denied papers, denied status, kept up borders, unable to get visas, given a long list of jobs in countries like Lebanon that they're not permitted to do, which is almost every job that any of them would be able to do. This people has suffered this great crime of their country being eliminated from world affairs. There are people suffering immiseration and misery decade after decade. But you want to know what the unkindest cut of all is? That they, the Palestinians, who are the victims of terrorism, are called the terrorists, while the people who visited this terrorism upon them are called the victims of terrorism. This is the unkindest cut of all. And it's the thing which drives so many people in the Muslim world completely crazy with rage. And this is something that people in the West have not grasped. They've not grasped how our double standards look in other parts of the world. I could spend the rest of this evening enumerating just some of these double standards. Let me race through a few of them. I've touched on one. Iran is being threatened with war and is being subject to sanctions because it does not have any nuclear weapons, has signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, is allowing the International Atomic Energy Agency to inspect its plants, has been described by the head of the IAEA as, and I quote, not seeking to develop nuclear weapons, unquote. Yet it is sanctioned and threatened by war, whilst Israel has been permitted to build a huge mountain of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons without the IAEA ever once requesting, never mind demanding, that they be allowed to visit Israel's nuclear sites without a single resolution ever being passed by the group of four, the group of five, P plus one, the G7, the G General Assembly, the United Nations Security Council, none of them have ever demanded the right to inspect Israel's nuclear site at the moment where Vanunu says there are hundreds of illegally held and developed nuclear weapons. Let me give you another one. Some of you may have seen the nine-minute video on YouTube during the Lebanon War in 2006 on Sky News. There is an excellent to jog your memory of the moment in the interview in which I asked the commentator who had been waxing lyrically, practically in tears, about the Israeli captives that had been taken by the Lebanese resistance inside Lebanon immediately prior to the Israeli assault on Lebanon in 2006. We were treated to the names and the backgrounds of every one of those captives. Their parents were interviewed, their children were interviewed, we were given a tour of their neighborhoods, their schools and universities. But when I asked the commentator if she could name just one, one of the 10,000 Palestinians
million of Lebanese prisoners being held in Israel's dungeons? Of course, she couldn't name one, and neither could a single government minister in any Western country, or any commentator, any interviewer, any leader writer, none of them, even though 50 of the Palestinian members of parliament are prisoners. The speaker of the Palestinian parliament is a prisoner. Great leaders, the Mandela of Palestine, Marwan Barghouti, yeah. none of them can name any of these people. None of them. This double standard drives people crazy. They say, how come the lives, the liberty, the blood of Palestinians and Lebanese is worth so much less than the life, the liberty, the blood of Americans or British or Israelis? You know, I always tell the story about the broadcast that was made on the eve of the invasion of Iraq by the wives of Tony Blair and George W. Bush. It was bad enough, the gruesome, twosome, <laughs> but they brought their wives into the act. They gave a synchronized swimming in the grief of the victims of 9-11 in a joint radio broadcast to soften up public opinion for the killing spree that was about to ensue. Both Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Blair asked us to remember those heartbreaking messages of farewell, of love, of grief left by those American women on those airplanes on 9-11. Heartbreaking indeed they were. And that grief was being used to justify the making, as it turned out, a million new widows and widowers. But the broadcast laid it on with a trowel. They even played some of the actuality of the messages from those mobiles on those answering machines. And when I said in the parliament afterwards, just because Iraqi women don't have mobile telephones and their loved ones don't have answering machines, it doesn't make their deaths delivered from the sky any less obscene than the deaths of those American women on 9-11. Does it? with that. But a moment's reflection tells you that that's not true. The deaths of Iraqi women, of Afghan women, of Lebanese women, of Palestinian women is of virtually no concern at all for the powerful in our society. But it is a heartbreaking, heart-wrenching mind-changing, life-altering reality for the two billion Muslims in the world. What I'm trying to do here is build up an understanding amongst Westerners in this audience of why the Muslim world sees us as they do. Why the Muslim world has become such fertile ground for those obscurantists who wish to hurt innocent people, to punish the guilty people. Why millions of Muslims are so filled with anger and rage at our double standards that many of them are ready to cheer when some of them are ready to die in order to kill as many of us as possible. You see, these monstrous acts that took place on 9-11, or on 7-7 in London, or on the trains of Madrid, 
or in any number of other plots which either failed or were thwarted or were actually carried out. These things did not come out of a clear blue sky. They came out of a swamp of bitterness and hatred which our actions, the actions of our governments, the injustice visited by us, the double standards practiced by us have deepened, have watered with blood and with you, bitterness and hatred. It's vital to know this because if you don't know it, then you can't grasp this great confrontation in which we are now locked in this world between East and West. And if we don't deepen, if we continue to deepen, if we don't start to drain that swamp, then more and more of these monstrosities will come out and hurt us. I have a three-point plan. Because people say you're very good at denouncing what's been and been done. What do you think we can do to get out of the mess that we are in? Well, first I make no apology for denouncing what's been. I, as was alluded to by Maria, I come from an Irish background. We know something about imperialism. We know something about occupation and partition. We know something about colonialism. Once, when I was a small child at school, I came home and told my Irish grandfather that my teacher had said that Britain had an empire so vast that upon it the sun never set. And my grandfather answered, that's because God would never trust the British in the dark. <laughs> any reason to doubt that. So I make no apology for saying that I hate anything called empire. Empire is organized crime, you know. That's all it is. It's going to other people's countries, killing and subjugating them, and stealing their things. It gets dressed up in fancier clothes than that, sure. In the past, was dressed up in religious clothes, Christian clothes. But I always say, don't confuse these Christians with real Christianity, with the message of Jesus. Real Christians believe in the prophets. Peace be upon them. These people believed in the prophets and how to get a bigger piece of them. That was their religion. Mammon. That's why they invaded and occupied other people's countries, to rob them. As Archbishop Tutu put it, they came to our country, they taught us to pray with our hands clasped and our eyes closed. And when we opened our eyes, they'd stolen the country all around us. So, I made no bones about this. Now that they dress these imperial adventures up in so-called humanitarianism, liberal interventionism, destroying countries in order to save them, in a sense it's even more repugnant, especially when in the mouths of those formerly uh, describing themselves as having been on the left of the political spectrum. But here's my three-point plan. These are the three things that if we did, we would so drain that swamp that those recalcitrants still insisting on their obscurantist hatred of other cultures, other religions, even other parts of their own religion would be beached. They would be visible. To use the old Maoist term, they would have no water in which to swim and would and could be eliminated 
as a threat. The first thing we have to do is to give justice to the Palestinian people. No justice, no peace. I mean, it's really, it's really not rocket science. You don't have to be Einstein to work out that if you don't have peace in the Middle East, you won't have peace in the world. And that the only way to get the peace is to pay the price, which is justice. What would that price look like? Well, the first thing that has to be done is to stop calling the victims of terrorism the terrorists and start calling the perpetrators of terrorism the terrorists instead of the victims. We have to have an acknowledgement from them. If not from them, then from those who pay for them that the Palestinians are the victims of this great crime. And that the millions now of Palestinians in exile and as refugees have the inalienable, unalterable, eternal, legal and moral right to return to their homes. There's an eternal search in colonial chapters to find a stooge leader who will somehow validate the colonial powers, previous actions, present stance, future ambitions. A long, long record. I see some African people in the hall. They'll recall some of them. When Jomo Kenyatta was leading the struggle for independence in Kenya, he was denounced as a terrorist leader to whom no one would speak. And all sorts of tame tribal chiefs were paraded one after the other as possible alternatives with whom we could negotiate. In Zimbabwe, when it was Rhodesia, they tried very hard to find a stooge who would validate the racist apartheid system that existed there. The final one, all the people will remember, was Bishop Muzarewa. They paraded him around the world. Muzarewa was their great black hope that they would put him in power but he would actually allow the white racist settlers to continue to call the shots, to pull the strings. Mandela himself was locked away for 28 years in the dungeons of apartheid whilst they tried all sorts of schemes to come up with alternative stooges that might pass muster as African leaders. They even created new Bantustan principalities, Transkai, Siskai, Boftutswana. They put princes and chiefs in charge of these little Bantustan mini-states and tried to pretend that somehow this was apartheid sharing power. But none of these schemes ever work. You have to, in the end, negotiate with the people who actually are the leaders of the people with whom you are in conflict. But the leaders, especially your leaders here in Canada, appear unable to grasp this fact that the only people entitled to choose the leadership of the Palestinian people are the Palestinian people themselves, not anybody else. You see, that would be true 
even if there hadn't been an election in Palestine. It would be obvious to any schoolboy that if you want to bring about an end to the conflict in Palestine, Israel, you'll have to deal with, talk to, negotiate with, find an agreement with those that are actually fighting in that conflict. But when those who are actually fighting took part in the only free and fair and democratic election ever held in any Arab country ever in all history and won it by a much bigger majority than Stephen Harper and Jason Kenney could ever dream of. Ten thousand times. Let me make it ten thousand and one. <laughs> I am not now, nor have I ever been, a supporter of Hamas. Still less in Mr. Kenny's fevered imagination. A member of Hamas. If I had a vote in the Palestinian election, it would not be cast for them. But there is no arguing with these facts that an election was held, it was described by Jimmy Carter no less, as a pristine election, pristine, crystal clear, transparent, perfect, and Hamas won the election. And you just have to deal with that. Pretend that Stephen Harper isn't the Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> I can't appoint somebody else the Prime Minister of Canada, though the apparition of Michael Lignatiev just flitted across my mind there. Talk about Tweedledee and Tweedledum. <laughs> two cheeks of the same backside. <laughs> but I can't appoint, I can't say no, I, I actually, I recognize Ignatiev. I regard him as the Prime Minister. It's just ridiculous, think about it. And yet that's exactly what's being done here in Canada towards the Palestinian people. In fact, not only are you not allowed to talk to Hamas, if you take, as I have taken five times in two years, convoys of hundreds of ambulances and trucks filled with medicine and wheelchairs and children's toys and baby milk and food and humanitarian assistance, if you take that to besieged Gaza and give it to the Minister of Health to distribute through the hospitals, you're accused of being a member of a terrorist organization. This bankrupts the meaning of the word terrorism in the English language. It means nothing if this can be described as terrorism. If somebody who gives wheelchairs to the Minister of Health in Gaza can be so described. And why is there a siege on Gaza? Because the people in that pristine election voted in a way that the big powers and Israel, the occupier, didn't like. What kind of democracy? do we have in our countries that we can decide to starve people's children to punish them for how their parents voted in a free and fair election. But that's what's happening and has been happening for now four long years. But of course, they didn't stop at the siege. 
in 22 days from the 27th of, Jan of December, Christmas time, 2008, for 22 days and nights. They did something that has not been seen in the world since the end of the Second World War. They locked 1.6 million Palestinians, 80% of them refugees, and therefore entitled under international law to the protection of the international community. They locked them up, 1.6 million, in what Prime Minister David Cameron of the United Kingdom described in Turkey last month as an open-air prison camp. They locked all the doors so the people had nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. And then they rained down death and destruction indiscriminately upon their heads. They killed 1,416 Palestinians, most of them women and children, the majority of them civilians. They killed them from land, sea and air, live on television, if you had the right TV station, that is. They even killed them with banned illegal weapons. You must have seen the plumes, the columns of white phosphorus gas. Imagine gas being dropped by a country calling itself, we don't accept it, but calling itself the Jewish state, dropping gas on people trapped in an open air prison camp. I know all about white phosphorus. I happened to be in Beirut in 1982 when Israel invaded and began its reign of terror through the south of Lebanon, circling and besieging an Arab capital, Beirut, and raining down white phosphorus bombs on the civilian areas, including the refugee camps. I went to the hospitals and saw the child victims of this white phosphorus. Little children lying in hospital beds, white smoke coming out of their noses and their mouths uncontrollably as they cooked to death inside. That's the meaning of white phosphorus. You breathe it in, it never leaves until you're dead. It cooks you to death from the inside. There is no antidote to it. It was bad enough in 1982 when there was no live television streaming. But in the 22 day attack on Gaza, the whole world could watch it happening. And who lifted a finger to stop it? Most countries remained silent. Canada supported it from the first day to the last day and defended the crimes that were committed against the refugees. Bush supported it. Obama stayed silent, hiding behind the fact that he had not yet officially taken office. The Arab countries, from Marrakesh to Bahrain, sat on their thrones, on their fat backsides, and didn't lift a finger to help the Palestinians being massacred in Gaza. These corrupt kings and puppet presidents who owe their chairs to the people who told them to remain silent and keep their borders tight and their gates and their doors locked. You may have seen, as I did, in the area of Zaytun, on the edge of Gaza City, where Israel demolished the entire area with the people inside their houses, killing in one case 35 members of the same family, 
refusing to allow the ambulance personnel, indeed deliberately targeting the ambulances to kill the ambulance personnel and destroy the ambulances, refusing to allow the rescue workers to go in and collect the wounded, the dying, or collect the bodies of the dead. You may have seen after five long days the ambulance man finally making it into Zaytun and holding up the little girl burned to a crisp, minus her legs which had been eaten off by the dogs roaming in the ruins of Zaytun. You may have seen as I did and interviewed the little girl who had been staying with our grandmother when she learned that our house had been destroyed by a rocket, she raced to the house. Her mother, her father and all five of her brothers had been killed. She was in an instant an orphan with only her elderly grandmother. I met the little girl, 11 years old. This is what she said to me. Where is this great Arab world that they teach us about in school? Where is this Ummah that they teach us about in school? Why did they leave us to face this alone? What did we do to deserve this and to face it alone? But they did face it alone. 62,000 houses were destroyed in 22 days. I don't know how many houses you've got in Edmonton, but just imagine going out tonight. 62,000 houses in Edmonton destroyed. And coming up for two years later, not a single one of those houses has been repaired or rebuilt because Israel refuses to allow a single brick, a single bag of cement, a single sheet of glass to go in to rebuild these houses. All to punish them for voting the wrong way in an election. And all done with the support, implicit or complicit, depending on which country you're in, of the powers that have stood behind the terrorist state of Israel from the beginning. The case of Britain, having authored the tragedy, when on behalf of one people, we promised a second people, the land which belonged to a third people, unique, even by imperialist standards or the American taxpayer who paid for every bomb, every airplane, every ship, every tank, every soldier, every gun, every bullet that Israel fired in those 22 days or in the case of Canada, a unique case, a country which turned itself from a loved and respected and admired country. The people longed that their country should be like Canada, reducing itself to an embassy for the most extreme right-wing governments that Israel has ever had. This is a very serious state of affairs. It shows how far we are from that justice. But justice there will have to be. There will have to be the return to their land and their homes of all the Palestinian refugees who wish to return. There's no getting away from this. And they hope, as I said, they can find a stooge who will sign away the rights of those millions of refugees who will accept some kind of surrender terms that will leave the thief in possession of almost all of their spoils 
I don't believe they will find such a stooge. But if they do, nothing the stooge signs will be worth the paper it's written on, because the conflict will continue until that justice is obtained. There has to be some recognition of the fact that Palestine, Israel, is a tiny piece of land. It's smaller than a single park in South Africa. All of it. There has to be recognition of the fact that the Palestinian land has now been carpeted with huge cities that they call settlements. Settlements sounds like yellow knife. Sounds like log cabins. These are giant cities which will never be knocked down, which will never be given to the Palestinians, that's for sure. There is no room for the Palestinian refugees if Palestine is just 23% of the land that was taken. The West Bank is separated from Gaza. The West Bank is separated from Jerusalem as well as from Gaza. I say it's time that we fought for the principled democratic solution to this conflict, which must be as happened on the fall of apartheid South Africa. We should have one democratic secular state from the river to the sea where the Jews and the Muslims and the Christians live as equal citizens under the law. One man, one woman, one vote. This is the only solution that I can see that accommodates the interests of all concerned. A binational state, Israel-Palestine, Palestine-Israel, call it what you like, Different people could call it different things. But this is the only way that justice can prevail. And without justice, there will be no peace. The second thing we have to do is end the Western occupations of Muslim lands. They are disastrous. that they are immoral, it's not just that they require us to send our children into foreign imperial wars, it's that they don't work. They're crimes, but they're also mistakes. The French statesman Talleyrand, on told of the murder of an opponent, his assistant said, it's a terrible crime, my lord. He said, it's worse than a crime, it's a blunder. These wars are achieving the precise opposite of what they were intended to achieve. They've killed millions of people, made homeless and exiled millions of people, all in the name of trying to stop radicalization, fanaticization, extremization in the Muslim world. But as I said in Parliament four days after 9-11, if we handle this the wrong way, we'll create 10,000 new Bin Ladens. Does anyone now doubt that that's what we have done? Maybe it's 100,000 new Bin Ladens. Maybe it's millions of new Bin Ladens. With each occupation, each crime, each bloodbath, we have deepened that swamp of bitterness and hatred to which I referred in the beginning. And nowhere is that more true than in Afghanistan. I see your government has broken yet another promise. They promised you you'd be leaving Afghanistan. Now you're going to be staying there another four years, mind you, only as trainers. <laughs> Does nobody ever ask in Canada, 
How come Karzai's army needs quite so much training? <laughs> Ten years they've been being trained. <laughs> Do you know what the budget for training the army in Afghanistan is? You have to listen carefully to this figure because you'll find it difficult to believe. The budget from Western taxpayers, including you, for training of Karzai's army is one billion dollars a month. One billion dollars a month training for 10 years. Have you seen any noticeable improvement in the performance of the Afghan army for that billion dollars a month? What did you do with a billion dollars a month? Nobody's training the Taliban. They're doing quite well. <laughs> We're spending a billion a month. Even though, according to the US government, last year, fully 35% of all the Afghan forces we train go out the back door and join the Taliban. <laughs> 35% of them, because the wages are better. <laughs> the Taliban pays better than Karzai. Well, you can understand it. Once Karzai had his cut, his drug dealing brothers had his cut, the warlords have had their cut, well, there's not much left for the trained soldiers. So they disappear and they join the Taliban. Your government says, your young men, 900 of them, will be safe now because they're in Kabul. Anybody seen the news lately from Kabul? Does it look safe to you? He says they'll be safe because they are behind barbed wire. Well, that doesn't feel all that safe to me. If you're in Afghanistan during an occupation, you're a part of the occupation. And those resisting the occupation will try their best to kill you. Canada has already paid too high a price. You have lost more dead soldiers as a proportion of your numbers than any other part of the NATO occupation of Afghanistan. Your young soldiers are being placed in danger not to train anybody. It's a farce. What could 900 Canadian trainers do to stop this? catastrophe which is unfolding in Afghanistan. You're there to provide political cover to the British and American governments and for no other reason. We have to get out of Afghanistan. We'll have to negotiate with the people who are fighting us in Afghanistan. Not somebody we mythically imagine we can negotiate with, but the people who are actually fighting us. Mind you, that's dawning on them now because we're practically begging the Taliban to negotiate with us. I read in the Canadian papers about the guy, the imposter from Quetta in Pakistan, showed up and said, I'm a Taliban leader. <laughs> so they filled his pockets with money. They flew him to see Karzai in the presidential palace. They gave him presents for his wives. He came back three times. They filled his pocket every time until they discovered he was just a guy who had a stall in a market in Quetta. That's how desperate we are to negotiate with the Taliban. It's good. But we better find the Taliban and negotiate with them before the money runs out. And the terms that we will leave Afghanistan on. This is the serious bit. Are the same terms that we could have had last year or the year before or at any time in the course of the entire war. Which means that all the people whose blood was spilled, all the lives that were lost, all the treasure that was expended, all the destruction that was caused, was caused in vain and needlessly. And those terms are this. We have a legitimate interest in ensuring that Afghanistan does not again become a base for Al-Qaeda 
international global terrorist outrage. And any Afghan government of national unity will sign that off. Not least because Al-Qaeda are no longer in Afghanistan. According to Bob Woodward, who has the best sources in the secret American state of any writer, in his latest book, Obama's Wars, is very specific, strangely, oddly specific. He says there are 45 Al-Qaeda fighters left in Afghanistan. So if there's only 45 of them, and we went there to destroy them, how come we're still sending hundreds of thousands of new soldiers and extending their tours of duty? The reality is though, and this can never be forgotten though some people don't appear to know it, there's something grotesque about the fact that we are killing Afghans today to punish them for having had in their country somebody that we sent into their country in the first place. We're punishing them because Al Qaeda used to be in their country, no longer is, while we armed, financed, and provided all the diplomatic and political support necessary for Al-Qaeda to come into existence and to be in Afghanistan in the first place. The third of my three points is this. I don't have to develop this point much. It will be obvious to some, to the Arabs and the Muslims in the hall, it will be more obvious still. The third thing we have to do to drain that swamp is to stop propping up the dictatorships, the tyrants who rule the Muslim world. I'm not saying invade them. I'm not saying invade Egypt in order to bring democracy to Egypt, but you have to stop propping up the dictator of Egypt, who for 29 years has 29 years with 99.9% .9 of the vote in every rigged election, whose jails are packed full of tortured prisoners, whose people, if they dissent, disappear, where corruption is so fantastically rife that despite being the second biggest recipient of American aid, Israel being the first, the vast majority of Egyptians are hungry and don't know if tomorrow they will eat. Where poverty and desperation inhabits every squalid alleyway of the 20 million population great Arab capital of Cairo where the Egyptian people have no freedom or liberty of any kind. I'm not asking the West to do anything against the Egyptian dictatorship. Just stop propping it up and its own people will bring it down. Probably. I could go through them all. <laughs> I could talk about Pakistan. I could talk about Pakistan, which has nuclear weapons, was allowed to develop nuclear weapons because it had a stooge general as its president. And they believed, you see, they, they don't read Frankenstein to the end, these people. <laughs> they don't realize these monsters get out of control. They thought that General Zia and after him, General Musharraf would last forever. And they'd all would have, always have a stooge slave leader in Pakistan. Well, they know better now. And we must all hope we don't all pay a terrible price for that decision.
to allow India and Pakistan to develop nuclear weapons. In fact, both India and Pakistan were rewarded for developing nuclear weapons, whilst Iran is being punished for not developing nuclear weapons. <laughs> or I could talk about Saudi Arabia. I could talk about our best friend, our best friend in the Arab world. Yeah. We're fighting for democracy, don't you know, in Iraq. But our best friend in the country next door is the unfreest prison state on the planet. We're against executions in Iran. So am I. How come we're not against executions on Friday afternoons in public squares with carved swords cutting the head of prisoners in Saudi Arabia? don't you know, in Afghanistan. But in Saudi Arabia, women are not even allowed to drive cars, not even allowed to set foot outside their house unless accompanied by a male family member. We're in favor of democracy in Afghanistan, whilst in Saudi Arabia there are no liberties or freedoms of any kind. The only thing we're interested in in Saudi Arabia is that they can still sign the checks for the military hardware that we give them to sit in a pile of rust in the desert. These hypocrites calling themselves Democrats. Do they think that the Muslims don't notice this hypocrisy? Do they think that the Muslims don't hear them talking about democracy in Iraq and Afghanistan whilst denying democracy to the Palestinian people, indeed starving them to death for practicing democracy in a free and fair election. These are the things that are filling this swamp with bitterness and hatred. And if you live by a swamp, it doesn't matter how many fly swats you buy. It doesn't matter how much you invest in all the paraphernalia of trying to deal with what comes out of the swamp, some of it, some of the toxicity will get through. So if we want a safe, a balanced world in equilibrium, it'll have to be a world more just. And if we want to stop this clash of what Huffington, Huntington rather called the, the clash of civilizations. Although I was reminded of Mr. Gandhi's famous words during the great struggle for Indian independence. An American journalist asked Mr. Gandhi, what do you think, sir, of Western civilization? And he answered, yes, that would be a good idea. <laughs> this clash of civilizations, this great conflict, if it's to be overcome, it can only be at the cost of justice. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you very much.